And then we want to see how the robot actually works. And he, just keep it, the contact is this thing is basically for school. They are learning coding in school. They are trying to learn some Python. And the local platform is a good environment for them to play and have fun. So the next agenda, I'll give you some background of how I get involved in the logo and uh, also the GPT and also actually how I need three things together. Yeah. Then we focus on the fine tuning a little bit. That really is a bit of talk before in the last session. You can see actually I think I mentioned that there are some disconnection between the GPT model and the Phoenix. That's that's the case you can see this. Then we have a few Azure demo, show you how to do the fine tuning process on Azure. It will be a short demo. Then we actually have this button. There are a few demos for the robots. Basically, the kids will just run on whatever they want. Then the robot will do as they said. Basically, in the end, it will generate some Python code. The Python code will navigate to the robot. And I will end the goal. In the last, I will talk about the vision. So, our vision is we are trying to win the Nobel Champion Cup. The small one is for the regional, the large one is for the national, and then the international is even bigger. Yeah, it's really fun when you work with little kids. Okay, uh, quickly introduction of myself. I'm Daniel Fang, I'm from Insight. Uh, I'm a senior architect. And then my day job is working with our client. We're doing a lot of use for cloud app and uh, integration. Then during the night, I have two kids at home. My boy is only seven years old, my girl is 11 years old, and during the weekend, I like most parents, I'm doing the Uber Java, just for free, <laughs> taking them everywhere, and uh, until, I think it's after COVID, the one day, I went to Macquarie University to pick up my job from the local club. They have a national competition there. And then I walk into the competition room, I saw a few hundred kids there, they all have logo in their hand, they have their robots, and then they compete with each other, dance and the scene. That's really impressed me with all the atmosphere there. Yeah. And that's a photo of it. So look, that's one robot competition, right? You see one team on the right hand side, the other team on the right hand side, and the guy with the, I think, biting on the referee. <laughs> so he will make a call on all the scores on the competition table. And what do they do is pretty much, you see all the little machines. They will control a robot step on here. The robot will be navigating by itself, try to score as much as it can. And that's the Spike Fun kit. So it's from Logo Education. It's very similar to all the blocks we have been using at home, the Logo blocks. The only difference here is you get all the motors, but all the sensors, and the wheels, and the most important way you get this little hub, which is the Spike Fun hub. You can run Python code on it. And it can interact with the, the Spike Prime app. Basically, you can do a lot of engineering around it. Okay. So, the story to me one day, I was uh, in the uh, competition in a parent's temple, and I talked to the STEM teacher. The teacher asked me, What do you do? I said, I'm a software architect. Then she said, So, you can code. I said, Yes. I said, Oh, I can code. <laughs> then she said, Do you want to come to the STEM club and the teacher kids coding? I said, okay, I will give it a try. And then that becomes a whole yes address. I go to the school once a week for an hour and a half, teaching little kids how to write Python, how to do the logo build, how to connect all things together. And then really fun. And one day, we have been talking about uh, the Python coding because it's the first time the girls tried to learn it. We have only about 10 years old. And we've also been talking about uh, all the open AI stuff. All the school kids, they know about it. They're actually trying to use them up in school. As long as they're not using that for homework, they are trying to explore <laughs> it. Yeah. It's going quite well. And then one girl told me, OK, I actually want to try. I tried to see the chat GPT and able to write some Python code for me. And that's what she did. Let's go to the next one. Yeah. Not too bad. Let's just ask a question. Write a Python code to resolve machine learning for the yeah, yeah, that's a competition name. 2034 season. The GPD is pretty honest, say I have a knowledge at all. So <laughs> I do not know anything in 2034, so I can't really help you too much about it. However, I can write some general Python code for you. It's a good base start. You can keep on building it. You can do more things as you like. 
for example, when the first time she write Python covers, I really good stuff. And then it was a good uh, Python on the CPU there. Looks totally professional. You got namespace on top, you got all the modern connections, so it knows which port going to which wheel. Yeah, finally, you have a few Python functions there. That right? looks very good. And I'm thinking it's kind of just work out. <laughs> Raise your hand. It works. Or not? Yeah. So then we did a, she did a copy paste. So all the code from previous last goes into this app. And basically, some background is that is the, like the ID of the logo spot point. It's like an app. You can write your Python code over there. Then you have that hub icon, it will give you some sensor reading, the uh, wheel spinning, all the stats you can see from there. Then when you want to run it, you will click the yellow button, it basically just press the Python code. Right? So the girl tells me the code does not work. And the error in there is import error, no module named the EV3 Dev2. <laughs> it's very simple, right? It's just to keep installed that and then everything should work. So I sit down with the girl for five minutes, try to figure out how I can do that on the laptop. Then I come to realization, it's not a simple. The issue is, it's a kind of a lockdown environment for our logo. You can't really do an additional package. And also the hub on the back of the robot, it uses a micro Python rather than the full scale Python. So a lot of library are not really able to install on it. And the worst of worst is that library Yes, the older model of Python of Spark Point. So it's the earlier generation called the EV3. Now the recent version is called Spark Point. So a lot of API calls are different. Pretty much a lot of has to do the API for the Python library. So it's probably never really going to work. Right. Now I have an issue that I've been bragging about how good the Python is, how good the open AI is, <laughs> and then the girls give a try, first error could not work. What do I do? That's a big problem for me because I'm going to go back to the classroom the following week and show them how we can make the code to work, right? So, a few issues. What I can think of. <laughs> Especially the girl is my daughter's good friend, so she going to keep on asking about it. <laughs> so, a few issues we have to solve here. The first thing is, are we able to actually use the GPT model to generate some code flow that will work for me straight away? I don't want to make it edits. In this case, the kids should just be able to see the code working, they make some edits to do more tasks, right? And also when I'm talking about the very young kids, they don't have any coding experience. They know how to do a, a stretch code, like a drag and drop, but not professionally writing Python code at all. And then it should be easy for them to use because they uh, typically read to difficult uh, coding errors that are losing interest or straight away. They need to see something working, then keep them very interested, they will keep moving. And also, the last two, want to use some GM generative AI features to be sure they are not writing the code, but they are giving instructions. And then, ideally, it should be nature narrative. The case is able to um, tell the model how it wants them to perform. And uh, also, the new season will start this August. So, Hopefully, it will be the same thing which you can work with in the new season. Okay, so how to solve it? For me, I think it's definitely about Python and it's also about the open AI. During that day, I'm spending a lot of time with Azure and we heard that the Azure Open AI service has a lot of features, like last talk says, they have all different modules available. Are we able to combine all those three together? And in the end of the day, we we're trying to bring kids who are right on home. And then it goes into here. Then we've got a plot of Python code coming out, and then the code will be run on the robot. The robot will start to perform. We just want to have a solution that will be able to run from end to end. Yeah, in my case, but probably it has to work the same thing. If you are trying to innovate your app, have an AI backend. That's some challenge you're going to have. You don't want someone manually sitting in the middle to fix the code in order to get all the code working. Okay. So how did I go? Let's take a look at the video. I want to drag it over. Give me a second. I'll bring it out twice. 
except to take the list out on the email. Okay, how to see that last? Can I see the mouse? I don't know where I am. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I will play it a second time. So that's the kind of snooping I in the end. Seems working. Let's do this a bit slower. So what a, a program does we have basically start with a Python function. In this case, I have coded the prompt, but basically you will be coding whatever you want to about to do, which uh, each command. Then the whole thing sent into a GPT model is still out of the Python function. Then this function will be run by your skin cable here, and the robot will start to move around. So it's a very simple demo screen. There will be more demo later on, and I will explain there are a few issues actually it cannot perform that well. But it seems like it's working. So what is under the hood? Okay, so behind the scene, it actually works like this. This is the overall solution. We have a GPT 3.5 model first, that we use that as a base model. We notice there are some limitations, things, some code that not run through the way trying to use the old model, and then some of the format of the Python code also have issues. So what we're doing here is we're trying to do the fine tuning process. Try to fit in a few examples that actually will be for the latest type from library, and also give you some knowledge of you have a sensor, you have a particular function, you can perform a particular task. So all this going to a fine tuning GPT model, I have a little in bracket. But that model, you actually is able to host that in Azure OpenAI service. You can use the play one, try to do some testing. Before you explore that as uh, API, the chat confusion API. Then from the other side, click back here, there will be interaction with the Python code. Python code will call the API to ask the question, get the code back. Then we have the micro Python here, which is the PyBot. The Python code will be sent to PyBot and eventually so you know, overall, that's how the things actually work out. But from the kids perspective, they are more focusing on doing the proper right and then making sure that it's the right field and the robot is able to perform. Okay, any questions about? Good. Okay, well, there are more examples later. All right. So what's the guts of the whole solution? I think it has to be here. How now we are able to fine tune a GPT 3.5 model into a custom model with now very specific domain knowledge, and you are able to influence it to do something you want. But the base model is not bad, like the Python code we saw earlier, it gets to like 70% of what you want to do. But we want to push it to another 20, 30%, so it will be more suitable to your workload. Okay, so let's talk about the fine tune. I think in the last uh, chat, you, we had a very good overview of what we are able to do in the GPT model. But in this case, we will be having another object here called the fine tuning. So, what it does is you will pick a good existing model. In this case, the 3. GPT 3.5 model is pretty good, very powerful, can do a lot of things. It also understands the Python code. So, we will pick that first. Then, what we do next is I will define a lot of uh, training data. This training data is about how the robot can use Python, what function you are able to use, how you can um, do different behaviors, and then try to do the task. Once you have the first two, you basically run through a fine tuning process on Azure, or it is better just updating all the few billion parameters with the scenario you have optimized, and then you are able to consume it. Then that's the earlier demo about. And that's not something new though. So that's a good line on my phone from internet from y'all. So in the past, you know, we have the initial GPT model, like uh, it's pre-trained with a lot of data. But then we have got the codex version, like a GPT, that is some tuning there. 
then it all tells that plot the Fermi zero model zero two, and then that eventually goes to different models. So what we are doing is very similar to that. Just we are doing for our own workload, and we're probably not going to use that big scale of data either. And we do have an option to do it. And that's the example. If you look at here, what we are trying to do is using the base model. The base model does not know the robot too much. So if we ask it to move forward the 50 centimeter, it will just say, oh, I move 50 centimeter. I have no idea about going into a wall, how I can not do that because I don't have the capability there. And on the right hand side, with the fine tuned model, what we are doing here, we provide a different knowledge. We are saying, you have a sensor and you have a Python function called check for obstacle. With this knowledge on this side, and you run the same prompt, the TPD model skill out actually the user range, and then they will keep on checking. Do we have any obstacle in front? And it slowly move 10 centimeters each time until it gets to the 50 centimeters. So that is the value we're trying to add using the fine tuner uh, model. Right. And what are the benefits? Looks like it's a fair bit of effort, right? It's a lot like out of box, so you need to create a training set, you need to register the process, you need to do additional testing. Why do we need to do that? The first reason is, in our case, the base model is not going to do what we want. There's the gap there. We want to reduce that gap or able to make our model smarter. The second thing is the complex limit because even with the base model, you can still do the few short option or you make your cutting very long, but try to cover everything. But the limitation is that always the limit. You are not going to each time pass that much complex into the model with the question. And all this token side in the end goes into the cost because they charge by token. And also it is about how fast it can respond. The more the API need to process, the slower response time we're gonna get. And then lastly, also again, but in this case, it's more like you need to compare because the fine tuning process actually has a different charging model. You pay for the fine tuning process and it will be an additional fine tuned infrastructure startup in Azure. So you need to do some comparison, which is more simple. And the last one is to protect your property engineering. Just imagine if you have client app, each time you have all your well engineer the pump, passing from client side in the API call, it's something you don't really want to expose. You would rather have this knowledge building to your model so other people are not able to steal your work, something like that. Yeah. Next one. So there are other techniques, like the earlier talk I mentioned. For example, we have zero shot, few shot, and a drag. These are all other MPL techniques we can use, right? We don't really need to go into the fine tuning until you found the least process that not work for you. And what does that mean? Let's take a look at it slowly. So the first two, the failure short and the few short, basically all relying on the chart completion model. In that model, basically, you are passing a system term. Then you will have multiple terms, zero to n terms. Then finally, you can ask a question, and then the assistant will give you the response. Right. So first one, zero short, it means you do not have that term. You will ask a question straight away. But in your question, you can pass additional knowledge additional context, it will be just a question straight away. Then the free shot means you have multiple terms. So you will engineer a few conversation. You ask a question, how you want the GP model response. You pass all these terms in together with your question. All this goes to the API you will know. And that's something you are able to influence the model. And the most important way the system term, when you do that from the like, open air model, you do have often switch to that. And that bit is very important. You basically set the theme of your scenario, how you want the GPT to respond, for example, speak like pirate or kind of uh, speak like Shakespeare, etc. So the system can be very important. Okay, now we have a demo coming up. So talking about the fine tuning so far, what are the process of the fine tuning and how do we run that in Azure? I will have a step-by-step -step demo. But that, that's my summary based on my experience. The first thing is you really need to understand your problem, making sure are you able to actually use other techniques to do that. And if you decide to go down the pathway, you choose your best model. And in this case, I choose the GPT 3.5. Basically, it's not a good choice because it's really supposed to be a codex rather than GPT 3.5. 
and with the reason I have to deal with it is so far the Azure only supports the fine tuning of uh, the French and uh, GPT 3.5. So I don't have the option to fine tune the code, code expert in the code that French. Otherwise, I think the result may be even better. Okay, so let's look at this. Oh, sorry, carry on. Then you will create some open AI service on Azure. It's a uh, Kind of an open, it is into filling a form. Normally, you will be approved, then you can create uh, your training data set. Those step four, you basically will spend a lot of time on it. It's about data engineering. You need to figure out what's your scenario, how do you communicate with the model, and influence it. Then, number five is all in Azure. You will be sending the data files in Azure from portal. You can do click ops. Otherwise, you can use CI as well, basically similar. The whole process takes about, uh, I think, uh, an hour to about eight hours to finish. It's quite long. Once you have the model, you will deploy it, expose that as an API. Then your Python code can talk to it via the chat completion API. Then eventually, the last two steps, you will be keep on evaluating your model, making sure actually it's doing better. Because the first thing that I found with the fine model is doing worse than the base model. So that's the best that's my scenario. They start to conflict with each other in the model that not know what to do. Then finally, you can do multiple times. You can find you a fine tuning model multiple times, but uh, uh, so some really people say, if you do that too many times, the quality actually will go down. So there are a few techniques you need to work out what's the best suitable work for you. Okay, let's go to the second demo. Uh, okay. So this is basically the Azure portal. The first thing you will do is go to the Open AI service. You will create the Open AI service. In here, making sure that you want to fine tune it, choose the North Central US. That's the only region currently allowed you to fine tune a GPT 3.5 uh, model. If you go to other region, you don't have the option there. Then you fill in all the other defaults. Now you can change. And once that's created, it takes a little bit time, not long. And then you will be able to see the front page of the open AI service. Okay, so here is the open AI service. You have all your subscription key and your emails on the left. But what we will focus on is more in the open AI. I think it's cut off here. Count, shrink it. Let's go. Then you go into the Open AI Studio. That is where you can have your playground, you have all your management scene, you can pick different models, deployments, and you can upload your data. Back. So in the model tab, you can see currently all the weather models are there. You've got TPD3, TPD4, text learning, and the zero. I think you get also other things down there. So in this case, we will focus on creating a customer model. Basically, it will use the base model. Then we feed a lot of signals into it as well. Feel it, but uh, before we go there, we have to upload some files. But there's a bug at the moment on this pop up. So there are two files you need to prepare. It's called the training file, basically having all these scenarios. The second one is the validation file, basically, it's helping the uh, process to validate your results, either that it's getting better or worse. So we have both files uploaded. And validation. In my case, I think about the 30 different scenarios there and the 10 for the validation. We go back to create our custom model, pick the one we want. At the moment, only GPD 3.5 is able to be fine tuned. Give it a good surface so we know it's uh, for the level. And then we'll pick the file, validation file first, the one we uploaded. So, training file first, then validation file. And in here, you have a few options. I'm going to play with them. But it will influence the result of your function. You have everything blank for now. Then you will start the functioning process. It takes quite, quite long. So when it's created, you can see that it is deployable as no. It means it's not ready. It basically, place your functioning into a queue. And then eventually, your item will be picked up in process. But in this case, we have all our files already sitting there. Before they come back the next morning, that takes a very, very long time. In my case, I think it takes about uh, six hours and uh, six and a half hours to finish the whole thing. The fine tuning only takes about, I think it would say it's, uh, it's already taking about half an hour, but the waiting time is very long. Right? 
And that's also raised a challenge because uh, it's a uh, reduced our productivity. It comes very fast getting response of your scenarios. You need to wait and see. And I will discuss it later how we can overcome that. So, once you have a funding model, we can account deployed model. That is basically as actually to set up an uh, open AI service API for your model. You will be able to communicate to it by Python. And now we call it level of using one, set a total limit, and click the next. That takes uh, about half an hour, basically creating the service. So once that says succeeded, you are ready to go. But it's working. And then we have level version one, basically it has our fine-tuned model somewhere. We are able to communicate with it right away. So I put a feature from the studio because the plain one here. Which you are able to make use of your model straight away to some test run. And in this case, we'll pick our fine tuned model. I have already engineered the system from saying you are an AI system for a little robot, etc. And we we'll give a test. First question can move forward 55 centimeters. The robot comes out of the model, comes back saying that's the command you can run. Move forward 55 centimeters. Then I send the question. Now, how about two things? Can you forward 30 centimeters and then make a test? <coughs> Looking good. We have two types of functions coming back. And if we look at the JSON format, we can see all the Python code is properly formatted as well. You shouldn't be able to use that on your robot straight away. So, this is basically how you can find you a GPT model on Azure. Right? And uh, like I said earlier, this particular step. Basically, is where you're going to spend most of that time. And then let's take a look what actually is involved there. Okay. So, that is about creating the test data, training data set, and also the validation data set. Okay. How does that training data set look like? It is just uh, an array of JSON, pretty much. And each item in the array is just your uh, chat completion API part. You basically define a uh, system part. Then you ask the question, you work out the answer, and then GPT will pick your name to understand what they're trying to do. So I will have a few examples in my first one. Then you need to be very careful with the data, because that is one of the struggles I had. I go through a lot of tutorials on the internet, and most of the tutorials now is upload this training data set, and then you can start the training process. And the issue is how to create that training data set. I don't have a large database, right? In my case, I don't even have any example of how I should start my fine training. Like, do I actually just check in the API documentation of Python to the GPT 3 or what should I do? So, end up after much test and trial and error, in the end, what I do is my question is what I want the robot to do. My answer is the precise Python function I want to see. And then I just create about 30 different examples and I can see how it works. And that's Similar, uh, most importantly, I'm not mentioning the system front. So when you do the fine tuning, making sure all your training data set has the exact same system front compared to what you can ask setting the API, because that's a very strong signal to tell the GPT model, I'm under that scenario, I don't want to include other things. For example, in the training data set, all these questions will start with the same system front. And then later on, when the Python calls the GPT model, I'm passing in the same system front. There are some examples later I will show you that. Okay, then similarly, you need to create your validation data set. In my case, you don't really want to copy the same data set and use that for validation. You want to do your engineering again. In my case, what I did is I have the basic command, one action or two action here. But in my validation, I actually want to make it to the next level. I have a few commands chained together. See if the GP model is able to understand what I'm asking for. Right? And then there's an issue here. The issue I have is I can create a scenario, I can upload that to Azure, I can wait for eight hours, come back to validate my scenario, work that out, and then I do that again for my secret scenario in the second day. So the issue is it's really not productive if I want to use the fine tuning to test my assumptions, especially on the learning. So the technique I worked out is, I actually, when I try to create a test case, I use the free shot, but I'm using that on the base model. I will see how the base model responds to my question and try to find out there are some gaps. And these gaps is what actually I got to that into my training data set and try to influence it. Again, I have an example for me. Okay, 
So that's good. Carry on. Now it is the unit. So once you have the fine tuning model, you have the test data, you have everything ready to go, we just need to integrate everything. You just test the robot stuff. It's just going through a USB cable on the top. You can also use Bluetooth so that you don't have a cable line at all. And then we will receive user input, like what the kids want to say, and then send that to the ChatGPT API. We got some code back, we need to do some cleanup. There are certain signals that add some noise into the response. So I don't have a good way to remove it, so I clean up. Then in the end, I put everything into a bigger script file. I will run that script file into the pipeline, which is just this hub, and then the robot will start to move around. Okay, let's take a look. So there are two demos here. The first one is about the perfect engineering, how we created the data set. The second one is about how the Python code actually works for the robot. Correct. Uh, let me maximize it. Okay, cool. Here we go. So that is an example of the training data set. You can see it is just a completion API. You got a system prompt, which you define the scene. Then you have a user prompt when you ask the question. Then you pretend you are the robot. You know what you want, and then you basically type in the answer. So that's when you are. And then you just uh, Repeat the same thing as the second scenario using the exact system plan. You have a different scenario. I want to move forward. You want to also move forward with a speed parameter. Then again, the third one, similar, is slightly different. In this case, I want to make it go faster and then should understand and change the second parameter. Right? So that's the training. Similarly, exactly the same format for the validating set. You do the same prompt, so system plan. Then, in your scenario, you make it harder rather than one action at a time. I want to have two actions at the same time and different parameters, values in distance. And then that's what I expect to come out. And again, you have a few more scenarios. Each of them can get a little bit complex and then see how your fine tuning model actually works out. Okay. I raised an issue here because uh, it's very hard to work with uh, the JSON format, right? You need to Having all the space on the curly bracket. So, what I did is I created a flat file, which is text file, and then use hash and then pass the block. The first line is a question, second line actually is the answer. I basically just create that file, I can work on this file very fast, multiple example here to copy paste. Then I created just a Python code there, it will pass that text file over there into those two JSON formats. It saves my time, so I don't make mistakes when I'm editing my examples. Cool. Then, then this basically is the command I talk into the Azure API. It's very simple. We have the model name, system prompt, user message. All that does is send a RESTful API to the Azure endpoints that we just deploy. And then we just get a message back. So in order to test out the difference between the fine tune and the base model, making sure it's actually working out, what that idea is that I have the same set of credit. And I run them against fine tuning model, and again, run the same thing against the base model. I want to compare is my fine tuning model actually doing a better job? Right, so I'm going to pause it. Okay, yeah, that's all. So when I left the fine tuning model, the one I left is the base model. I'm asking exactly the same question to both. So in the fine tuning model, actually, the output with the math and kit. And also, you put a weight in front of the screen. But in the base model, it's just Python block and then having those two same functions. The difference is important because uh, we're talking about a robot. If you don't have a weight command there, yeah, the robot is go straight into that command. You then not wait for the stress thing to finish. Right? And also, in here as well, if you take a look at the format of the code, sometimes if it has an additional code block there, yeah, I can't use that code block in the Stack from straight away. I need to do additional cleaning up. I need to do other work to make sure. And then, yeah, so basically, I go through all the 10, 20 examples, making sure my fine tuned model with my training data set is actually going towards the result I want. Just some technique. I think that's uh, this one. I'll go to the next one. Basically, how the robot interacts with everything else. Okay. 
I think. Andy. So this is in the end uh, the cover map of the two control the robot. It's actually a very simple, it's only a few times. Uh, so that's the start Python, basically. All that does is uh, setting the model name, define the system term. And in my case, I'm like, I did define a list of scenarios, but it's basically the kids will input whatever they want in the end. And this thing is going to a loop, you will type in the prompt, give command, and then it will just uh, uh, send this uh, system prompt into the root function. The root function basically has a system prompt, user prompt, and then it gives have the model name. So in the room, Python is very simple. Just make a call to the Azure because you're using the, uh, the Azure Python library pretty much, and then do a little bit cleanup. Then what that does is the response coming back from the GPT model will be injected into a large Python function. I will show you what's inside. But that is basically the code library of your pipe class within the last year, which you can see from this day. Then you have the whole thing combined. The whole thing combined, we're going to a script file. We use the ANPY command to interact with the robot. It's via USB connection. And that's the code we generate and combine. Then we run the whole command in one go, and it goes to the robot. And the robot starts to behave. And that's the output that we see here earlier in the demo. Okay. So then let's take a look at that chat. The chat is basically very simple. It's just a response API call to the Azure OpenAI service. You have that library over there. You will configure all your API keys, all the endpoint details. Then you have a system prompt and give a message. Then in the end, you make a call to the chat completion API. One thing here, I did set the temperature to zero. Just won't make my life easier. So each response I get is more deterministic. And then finally, you have the code, a little a in your output message, and then you print out that's what's in the demo. Okay. And then finally, I just quickly show you what's in that file. That file, what's goes there? Yeah. Basically, it's a very large Python file. So if you go up, there are a lot of lines. They have all the library, the spec firm can support, the micro Python can support. We check in the response code on the top, basically whichever the GPT model gives us. Then inside it, you can see there are a lot of other Python functions. These are the utility we built the last year, basically to control the robot in there. You don't need to work with individual wheels. You can call in a hyper class. And then our GPT model is basically trained on these functions, make this easier to kind of guess to. Right? Okay, good. Any questions so far? Well, I go for the next demo. Yes, um, can you compare independent write models with your function for example? Yeah, I think I didn't go for a regular model at all. I did compare with, uh, I feel like, GPT-3 and then the, I think the French and the code the French. I did a few tests, but in the end, I think I found out that GPT-3.5 actually works better for whichever you, yeah. But probably more time. I, I'm exploring other models, yeah. yeah. And in my case, it's more about like, uh, writing out of the code rather than you are building a bigger knowledge base. So that's why I think that codex probably makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Let's uh, move on. We have 15 minutes left. So that's it. Okay. So the next step is now the third part. We will have some real demos the robot can come up. But in the end, uh, what we are doing now is we have everything ready to go, but uh, we want to find a way to evaluate if the robot is performing well. We are doing a QA for ourselves. In this case, we're dividing them into different categories. The basics forward, backward, and left, and right, very easy command. They should really know it without any issues. Like, that's very simple. High levels. Actually, I'm not telling you exactly what it is that the command you need to do. I will give you a problem. Say so you need to move around in a circle, you need to move around square obstacle. See if the GPT model is able to perform something similar to do the work. 
but it's more generative if you to think about it. Then also I'm trying to see if it is going to use some Python syntax. In my training, I did not provide any Python syntax, it will be all from the base model. There are more difficult sensors. So the stack prime has distance sensor, color sensor, and up for zero sensor. This sensor will bring the robot into the next level. It will need, it is able to see, it is able to feel, and how the model is able to produce the model curve like that, which will be really cool if it can do that. But let's look at the demos. So it is seven different videos that I will pause in between. So number one, sorry, start with number zero. So first exercise, basically a zero one, the kid will type in a command like that. So it's same with the test on the bottom. So move forward 15 centimeters and go back one to five meters. I do that on purpose. I'm not using centimeter. I see if the GP model is able to figure out how to convert that into a different function parameter. So the question is sent to GP model. It got a response back looking good. You change the, the parameter to 19, and then you change the meter into 25 centimeters. And the robot just move forward and backwards. Right? Simple. That's a win. Next example, I want to make a turns, but I want to turn three times. And once they turn the left, we can need to turn right for half cycle. So let's see how that goes. One, two, three, and then turn back. But right? so this one is more well, it's harder because they say we are changing a few commands three times. And then it will turn back from the other way. So can then know if there's the issue with the video. Yes. What's that? Other way around. Yes, precisely. But that's my mistake, though. No? Because I'm recording that part of the video with the camera, so everything was in the opposite direction. And I cannot flip that whole screen graph because I will mess up the of that. So just remember, left and right, right and left in this demo. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion. I said my kids criticized me with this quite a bit. I say you need to fix it. But I said, no, I'm not spending the whole story again doing all these videos. <laughs> okay, look at the next one. <laughs> number three, uh, number two, sorry. So, what's we'll in the loaders? So, it has loaders on top and also have loaders in the front. I want to say you spring the top one first. You got to come back, that's looking good. So, clockwise and keep clockwise. Okay. So, once that's done, I want to spin up the loader over there. It's well in the front. Okay. So, this is a question. And I want to notice some issue with the, this one. My command says we can need to uh, front arm for one whole round, but that cannot go one whole round, right? Anyone have any idea why that's the case? That's the disconnection between the physics and the model because the gear in the front is a larger gear there, but it translates into small gear, they're not small gear, it goes here. So this is the thing the model itself does not know, you cannot understand how your robot looks like, but not understand how all these gears connect together. And that's something, a challenge, one of the challenges I had, because we all know it does not understand, we can't do much about it. Okay, you know, number three, show me a uh, move around a square. In this case, the instruction is not really descriptive at all. I'm just giving a problem, you can do it. I'm looking good. The code is looking good. It's actually in a Python loop. Each time we move forward and make a turn. And let's see how to look up there. All right, that's one side, the second side, the third side, back to the beginning. That's actually a quite a good one because in my training model, I never told the, the GPT model how to how a square looks like. It must be using the knowledge from the base model try to figure out how it needs to behave. And also the Python code generated is smart too. They actually, rather than repeating code block, they put them into a loop. And that's the things the kids will be very interested to understand because normally they just go sequential each command, but they open a different ways to do the same thing in a loop. Yeah, okay, good, next one. Number four. So what we want is zigzag pattern. Well, that's even more abstract. It's not even a uh, shape, it is zigzag. Does the model understand what's zigzag? Good, we have a loop here, and then it does. Sort of works. 
But then here, I did not provide any training example on zigzag. It came out of the cell. Right? I only tell the model you can move forward, move backward, and then left and right. Okay. So even harder, now the number five we want you to move in a full circle, and the answer that we need is 15 seconds. My table is very small, but let's see if you can carry it. I found it interesting, right? It's not a very smooth turn. You think they're trying to go forward, stop, forward, stop, and keep on doing it. And it's half circle, no doubt. And it's coming back. The last one circle. And it's not going to stop. You decide to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> you keep going. Yes, stop. So although it's not too bad, it does go like a circle fashion, but it definitely gets the calculation wrong because it's uh, like one half circle rather than one cycle, right? And also the issue of the robot here is that the turning is not like a smooth left turn or turn around in a wrong mode. It's like a go forward, stop, go forward, stop. And the reason of that here is that it did not turn it, saying you have a thumb tree. You can have two wheels, one move faster than the other one. That's the proper way to make a turn. I'm only giving options saying you can only move forward in a turn. Because that is exactly what the robot is trying to do, to try to walk around what function it can do. Right? And also, there are some math problems there. It's definitely turning too much in the loop. And also, remember that it's still just a kid's toy, it's not top level engineering. So there are a lot of discrepancy with the Mode are turning and also depends on surface. It's a lot of issue, actually. Practical, physical issue and the mass problems. Yeah. Okay, we have one more. Oh, one more. Mm -hmm. So, this one I'm trying to say, can you do a thousand? Like, also uh -huh. say, you can only do 20 actions. Don't, don't go crazy with it. Let's see. <laughs> all the rest. Oh, all right. All right. So, all the code does is uh, just spin the wheel on top. If they're not ready, I was hoping that I can try and do some. Movement on the wheel, the bounce, but uh, no, it did not work like that. And uh, what it does is in the training, I did give it some reference saying if you are happy, you want to do a bounce, you basically spin your wheels, and it looks like it doesn't take that into consideration. But the other issue is in my prompt, the reason I need to put in the only 20 action, because without that, it will max out to the <laughs> token by the spin the wheel. So that's the limitation. Like it's just trying to work it out if your command, your prompt is not specific enough. Oh, good. I think that's uh, the last one. Yeah. Oh, good. Right. Let's go back to the slides. Okay. And then let's look at two examples in details. We're almost there. So the last two questions are the ones the hardest scenarios. I didn't do a demo, but let's look at them. So the scenario here. Basically, I want the robot to detect that obstacle. And then if there's nothing in front, you move forward. Otherwise, you just make a leap. But the response we got from the robot is like that. It's pretty good. It's actually putting them into a loop. And then you use the function I told the robot in the training set, saying is there an obstacle? And then it has if there are conditions, move forward and B, then otherwise it will keep on moving. And then very nicely to have all the comments there. Or really have the case if they don't understand syntax, they have something they can reference and they can build up to. Yeah. Then on the right hand side, similar, but we are using the color sensor. It's like a real life, a real life scenario, real life move, real life move. Very similar, detect the color, it's a building question. Take it, take off with the color, stop, don't move, and move forward, then in the end, keep on checking. So overall, the quality of the Python I'm uh, getting in the end is uh, something you can work with. It's a rough play work. It's for the basic command, and it's, you know, for some more advanced uh, syntax while you fall, being also able to provide a good uh, kind of result. Yeah. Okay. So I think I'm covering most of the demo. The vision, that's what I'm hoping to do next, if we got time, because the newly season will start in August, and that's the time. They will release a new map, there will be a new theme this year, it's about water, and then release all the missions. We're trying to work with the kids. By the way, I'm the coding mentor of the team, and the STEM teacher is their coach. So, what I'm hoping to do next year is uh, basically improve the model. It can handle more wheels, more gears. And also, we know on Azure we have the uh, vision, uh, vision and the speech. It will be 
be nice if they talk to the computer around and having. And then for the AI vision, it would be really, really nice if we can scan the computation map to try to figure out what's the best way to resolve around the map because you have a time limit, things like that. But uh, let's see how we go. And also with more sensor, distance sensor, color, and force sensor. And last thing is try to keep it working from Bluetooth. Because right now, you need to have a cable that is very hard to work with. And then that's how it in the end looks like. Right. So I did share the slides to my girl before I walk into the demo asking for the system feedback. He wrote me a full A4P page of feedback and to fix them. And then in the end, she said, Dad, you are finally doing something useful. <laughs> Let's take that as a compliment. The explanation. But the next day I think about it, she probably is more talking about the question mark. <laughs> we will see how we go. But uh, it's a really fun thing for me to do, like at home with kids, because we are still being doing the work. At home, we can still use Azure with GP model, try to explore what we can do to use AI to solve your problem, attack your issue, even at work. By doing this exercise, I get to know more about the limitation of the model, what it can do, what it can't, and it give you a few options you can improve it. Ah, okay. That's question. Any question before? Ah, so first stop on here. Yeah, I've got a question. So with the edge of uh, OpenAI, do you need to apply a separate child GDP like, uh, account? No, no. I think uh, when you go to Azure, when you try to create the OpenAI service, it does have a form you need to fill in, fill in saying who is your company, what's your email address, and it will be approved by the OpenAI team. Once you get through that, basically you are able to create an open AI service and then you have the billing model behind it based on how many AI calls you use. Yeah. Okay. So but uh, again, I think the similar option is also available in other like, providers. You can find the one you really like. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's an absolute presentation. Yeah. And I really like the detail we gave you like for how to like implement this. Yeah. And I have one question about like the fine tuning process, like how much actually you spend or like the money you spend on that fine tuning. Good question. <laughs> I learned my, my lesson the hard way. I created the open service uh, so the fine tuning model and it run for the next few days. Then my Azure account a lot come in saying you are exceeding your spend limit because I'm using the credits, right? And I look at the estimate cost. With three days of use, it estimates in the end of the month I can be paying a hundred, sorry, uh, $1,800. So it's very expensive, making sure you have your budget limit set there, so you don't go over the limit. But uh, I think that uh, from what I heard, uh, when it runs the fine process, it charges you about 50 bucks an hour. But uh, there's a catch, because you are using the fine tuning model, it doesn't have additional infrastructure to set up. It's not same as the base model, and they probably are being used by that as well. I think it's about $100, $200 a day. Just be aware of where it's going. Yeah, it's good yeah. Um, Thank you. Uh, thanks. Really good talk. Uh, yeah. I love the intersection of something really simple yeah. combined with AI to try to make it accessible. <laughs> Uh, and then also having real world engineering issues on top of software and everything else. Yes. I think it's like a really, really good learning curve. Like you make it as well as you want, yeah. and then wheels just spin on the car or something. Anyway, um, I was going to say, what, what with the fine tuning model, what is the bias of the fine tuning over the base model? Yeah. So, for example, you had the weight keyword coming in because you were like, I really want this command to finish before yeah. the next one. Yeah. Um, but then if it has, you know, uh, thousands of examples of not seeing the away people with before, I'm just interested in what the overriding bias is of the line tuning. Sure, sure. That's a very good question. I think that from my experience, because that's totally the first time I'm actually explore how to integrate the AI with the modern app and how to get to an end to end solution. My feeling is that depending on how much percentage you want to push your app to do, because if your app is just a chatbot, it's okay if the response is only 70% there. You have the end user there, they can make judgment. But in my case, it has to work seamlessly. You don't have someone sitting in the middle trying to 
fine tune or fix your results a bit further. You want to push 70% to a bit further, 90%, 95%, and then you want to your system the app to run seamlessly from the end user point of view. Right? So that's the one reason you can consider to use the fine tuning process to improve the quality of the results. And you can build some further knowledge into the model so it can perform your task better than other one. But it's case by case, and you need, do need to think about what's the user case. And to answer the second part of the question, um, it's hard. I haven't found a very good way really to intensively do the perfect engineering to see a way certain things that I need to do or the other thing that you don't need to. That's some learning I will keep getting. But uh, overall, from what I read about, you basically need to engineer your uh, training data set. You need to have very clear message in your training data set saying that's the scenario you need to use that weight. And that the other scenario you don't need. You need to get like black and white scenario there and make it say those two scenarios are not actually conflict with each other because there are certain scenarios I have, like uh, in the end the fine tuning gets confused. It does not know when you need to do it and do not need to do it. But that's some learning I think yeah you need to carry on. And that there are a lot of data science they have engineering inside as well because I'm from app background and I deal with all the coding thing. But the way I sit down to create the uh, training data set and everything, data set that we're like to my head, I don't know where to start. And it's a kind of boring process. And then get it right, get it wrong, and don't know the next move is the right move. Or that's yeah. Yeah. Is there a specific reason you chose? Good question. So I think everyone will agree it really should be using a codex rather than GPT 3.5, which is a chat model. The only reason is in Azure uh, service, right now, only the bench and the GPT 3.5, you can do the fine tuning. It does not offer a fine tuning for any codex at the moment. But if you really want a codex, you can try yeah, other platform. You might be able to do it. Yeah. Last question before lunch. Nice. <laughs> All right. Um, just before we clap for Daniel, um, there are some more prizes, so don't think that you will have lunch and then go away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have deliberately um, kept with you um, that these are the prizes which you are going to win after lunch. So make sure you come back. <laughs> and um, round of applause for Daniel.